Hello, I'm James Nye, and I'm going to read you some excerpts from Peter Owen's autobiography, Not a Nice Jewish Boy, Memoirs of a Maverick Publisher. It's available to order from all good bookshops. There's also a Kindle ebook edition available from You Know Who. Just to set the scene, Peter was born in Nuremberg in 1927 to German Jewish parents. His mother had been born in England and was a dual national. It was thanks to her British passport that Peter was able to migrate to London in 1933 and escape the horrors that the Nazi regime inflicted on other Jewish people, including many members of his own family. Peter became a publisher in London in his early 20s and set up Peter Owen Publishers in 1951, when he was 24. The firm gained a reputation for publishing literature in translation, for pioneering books on social themes, and work by LGBTQ writers. Peter published novels by several winners of the Nobel Prize in Literature, and he was awarded an OBE for services to literature in 2014. He was still chairman of the company when he died in 2016, aged 89. Shortly before his death, I helped Peter write his memoirs, as he was partially cited. The following extracts are about Muriel Spark, the Scottish novelist and poet, who, as a young woman and before her career took off, helped Peter out in his early publishing ventures. Spark had been born in Edinburgh in 1918 to parents who had English and Jewish Lithuanian ancestry. She came to work for Peter during the mid-1950s while she was waiting for her acclaimed first novel, The Comforters, to be published. She based one of the characters in that book on Peter's eccentric uncle Rudy. She also drew on her experiences of working for Peter, something of an eccentric himself, in later novels. She's probably most famous now for her novels Memento Mori and The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. The latter was made into an excellent film which starred Maggie Smith. During the period I first knew Muriel Spark, she was undergoing a religious transformation. She got herself baptised as an Anglican in 1952, then confirmed in 1953, but... Having decided the Church of England was too modern, was received into the Catholic Church in 1954. She even contemplated becoming a nun. She dumped boyfriend Derek Stanford, having started to see their relationship as sinful, though their increasingly shaky friendship continued for a while. During this time of renewed religiosity, and perhaps not coincidentally, she had begun taking amphetamine tablets. In those days, you could still buy dexedrine at the chemist as a diet pill, and, besides helping her economise on food and lose weight, it kept her alert through nights of fervent research and writing. But the combination of overwork, malnutrition and dexedrine sent her quite potty. Throughout 1953, Muriel had become obsessed with the writings of T.S. Eliot, and insisted that he was sending her prolific, threatening messages through complicated cryptographic anagrams embedded in his work. At one point, she even claimed Elliot had been eavesdropping on her friends by posing as a window cleaner. Discontinuing the amphetamines and taking a prescribed antipsychotic put an end to her paranoid delusions, some of which had included anti-Semitic abuse, perhaps because her father was Jewish. Muriel had help from her new circle of Catholic friends, but it was ex-boyfriend Derek who provided the crucial support by soliciting funds from her admirers. I don't know what she'd have done without him. Her supporters included David Astor, Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh. The last of these fictionalised his own drug-induced madness in his 1957 novel The Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold. At the end of 1954, Muriel retreated to lodgings in the Carmelite Priory at Aylesford in Kent. While there, she asked Derek to clear out her room in Kensington, which was presumably when he purloined some of her papers to sell off later. Though her beloved poetry had failed to get her noticed, 
she was well enough established as a critic, essayist and prize-winning short story writer for Macmillan to express interest in the novel. By the time she was well enough to return to London in mid-1955, she had written the first chapters of her debut novel, The Comforters, which cleverly transformed her experiences of madness into what is still a striking and readable book. Macmillan prevaricated so long over the contract that Muriel came to work for me at £5 a week salary for three days' work. At 50 Old Brompton Road, conditions were fairly spartan, but we got on well and she seemed generally thorough and efficient, despite staying up all night working on Robinson, her second novel. When I first started out, I had attempted to do pretty much everything myself, so it was a boon to have someone as efficient and reliable as Muriel working with me. She would proofread and help with publicity, editorial and secretarial work. She could even take shorthand. In her memoir, she says she enjoyed the atmosphere working with me and her colleagues, Mrs. Bull, the office manager and secretary, and Erna Horn, our bookkeeper. Of working in our small premises, Muriel writes that we were very attached to each other and describes working with one light bulb, bare boards on the floor, a long table, which was the packing department, and Peter, always retreating to his own tiny office to take phone calls from his uncles. Like all of literary London, she knew Uncle Rudy from shopping at Zwemmer's, and he must have known he was the basis for the Baron in her novel The Comforters. He never commented on this, and, knowing his temper, I didn't think it politic to bring it up. Rudy had a sort of act he performed at the shop, and would pontificate if people asked him for reading suggestions. He got to know a great number of authors and literary figures who doubtless found his advice useful and were amused by his foibles. As with Rudy and the Baron, Caroline, the main character in The Comforters, is partly Muriel, yet not wholly her. I also recognise many of Muriel's early experiences in publishing in her 1988 novel, A Far Cry from Kensington, though I do not believe the character of the book publisher is based on me. Muriel worked with me until her success was sufficiently assured for her to work full-time as a writer. Derek Stanford was so upset by her acclaim that he had a breakdown. She was relieved when he put himself in the hands of a psychiatrist and wrote to her saying he'd been advised not to see her. It made him ill, he said. As well as correcting the record in her memoir, Muriel exacted revenge on Derek in her fiction mercilessly lampooning him as the pisseur de copie Hector Bartlett in A Far Cry from Kensington. Derek, who died in 2008, must have been aware of this. She could be pretty ruthless, and also put it about that Derek was gay. I don't know whether he was or whether she was just being vindictive. I remember in The Comforters, Caroline tells the Baron that her typewriter is writing the novel of her life. Is the world a lunatic asylum then, she asks? Are we all courteous maniacs, discreetly making allowances for everyone else's derangement? The Baron thinks she's largely right, and warns her that she may be mad. Caroline replies, The intelligentsia are all a little mad. That's what makes us so nice. The sane are not worth noticing. Fame didn't make Muriel any nicer. Many of her friends, who, like Derek, had helped out in the early days when she was poor and unwell, also found themselves dumped. She became increasingly glamorous and grand, cultivating high society friendships to match. Her appointment as a dame in 1993 seemed to exacerbate matters. She became quarrelsome and litigious. Her agent used to be terrified when she came to town. Muriel had a very unpleasant quarrel with her son Robin, too, who must have felt terribly neglected. He had a tough life from the start. In early 1944, when he was five, she abandoned him to some nuns in Rhodesia while she fled from her mad husband. Arriving in England, she briefly joined the intelligence services. When she finally got Robin back in autumn 1945, she dumped him with her parents in Edinburgh, while she pursued her career in London. I suppose that was the only way she could pursue a career. 
I remember Muriel coming to a dinner party in the early 1960s after the triumph of the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Look what Robin made for me, Muriel said proudly, showing off the rings he used to make from semi-precious stones. They were still on good terms, but things soured terribly as Robin continued to pursue his Jewish heritage in his life and in his paintings. She notes in her memoir that her parents, who did all the hard work of bringing him up, were pleased when Robin decided to be a Jew, as she put it. She paid for his bar mitzvah party, despite the implication that she wasn't impressed herself. I suspect that this was Christian disappointment rather than outright anti-Semitism, but she was furious when he later claimed that, as well as her father, his grandmother was Jewish. It was, she thought, wishful thinking and simply untrue. Ruthlessly, she cut him out of her will. In curriculum vitae, one can't avoid noticing that she's much more effusively loving about her cat, Bluebell, than her son. Thank you.